If you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians. God's Electric Power Company. Turn to Colossians, <clears throat> chapter... Um, I'll find it here. Chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to go, I think we'll, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to start with uh, verse 6. Chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2. We're going to talk a little bit about Thanksgiving. Chapter 2. And now that you're there, I'll let, I'll let you find it. One of the things you could do... Um, if you're a new student of the Bible, one of the best things you can do is remember how the Bible's laid out. I'll do home Bible studies with new believers, and I always notice it takes them a long time to find their place. Just a little bit of study. You can kind of learn where the books are. It'll help you a lot. That little thing I gave, God's Electric Power Company, what is that? Anybody remember? Huh? Remember? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Colossians, that, that's the order. Sometimes people get those books backed up. But if you remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels. You have the history book, the book of Acts. Then you have Paul's letters, the general epistles, and then the revelation of the apostle John. If you can kind of get that in segments, it's easy to flip there. The Old Testament, what we got? Got the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the law and Genesis. Then, then what happens after that? History books, then what happens after that? Poetry, the writings, and then after that? Major prophets, minor prophets. Last book of the Old Testament? Malachi, first book of the New Testament? Matthew. You say, Brother Brad, why are you going through that? Because I've learned, being a pastor, that not everybody knows that. Then they get embarrassed when they're <laughs> flipping through their Bible and trying to find stuff. You really do a lot of good to know that, so it kind of helps you to locate. Like, I don't always know where Zephaniah is. I have to do a little thinking, but I know it's a minor prophet. I know it's toward the back. So if someone says Zephaniah, I know I got to go to the back of the Old Testament. Did you know that? Yeah, so, so that kind of helps you uh, get yourself in place there. Let's read this. Everybody found it? Okay, Colossians chapter 2 says, So then... Just as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live in Him. That's Paul's whole message. It really is living in Jesus. You call it walking in the Spirit. You could call it walking in the light. You could call it walking in truth. You could call it walking by faith, walking in love. It's living in Him. He says, live in Him, rooted in and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thanksgiving. And I really want you to key on this. And I've been really, my thought here lately, Charlie, I've been really trying to teach things that'll be helpful in our Christian walk. I can get up here and preach like a house of fire and preach and ask you next week, what did I preach on? And no one knows, or maybe just a few people remember, but I feel like if I can teach things and come back at things, if you can learn something to live by, it'll help you a lot. And one of the things um, as believers is we don't understand just how important Thanksgiving is. Just how important it is. Even in the secular world, you'll, you'll listen to guys, and I've talked about this before, they'll talk about the power of gratitude and being thankful. And I'll hear people, you've, you've heard it, you know, you know, on the podcast or the radio, and they'll say, just the power of being grateful. And so these people that don't even know the Lord, they've tapped into a principle, and it's true, that you're, you know, you, you're, you're being grateful and positive in life, and you're attracting that to you. And I'm not going down any new age roads or anything. It's just a principle. Paul tells the believers in Philippians 4 that whatever is lovely, whatever is a good report, whatever is praiseworthy, think on these things. And he's not telling you that for nothing. There's a very positive benefit from letting your mind dwell on good things. Now, I, th I thought a lot about this. I was reading this week, you know, the Bible uses language of warfare all the time. All the time. Because as believers, we're in a battle. You got all kind of, you got your flesh that wants to fight you. You could have problems in your physical self. 
that want to fight you and drag you down. You have people that will want to drag you down. Just life itself, that if you, if you watch too much of the news, that will drag you right down to the cesspool. You just, there are so many things that battle us, and we are in a fight of faith to keep our attitude thankful and grateful and on the Lord. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? And is he Lord of your life? Well, if he's Lord of your life, and you believe that he's Lord, and that's what's coming out of your mouth, and i got a lot to say about that, about what comes out of your mouth, then Jesus is Lord. This whole thing operates by faith. The principle of faith is thankfulness. If you'll flip over, you don't have to go there now, but in Romans chapter 1, uh, Paul talks about how because people were not grateful and they were not thankful, it says that their foolish hearts were darkened. You cannot be negative, ungrateful, unthankful, and have a heart full of light. This is for, for me. This is for all of us. And this spiritual battle you're in, it, the battle that you're in, not against flesh and blood, the spiritual battle you're in, the principle of the enemy is he is trying to take you off of your ground of faith because the just shall live by faith. The covenant works by faith. Everything you get from God operates on faith. Your victory, uh, 1 John says, this is the victory that overcomes this world. What? Anybody know? Faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes this world. So every attack on you, everything that happens to you in a negative way, whether it's the devil, your flesh, or whatever, is to knock you out of faith and knock you out of thanksgiving because the Bible says at that point, our foolish heart becomes darkened. We can't see clearly. We can no longer see in front of ourselves. And thanksgiving is actually one of these weapons we have in the face of things that are coming at us. But we will not be thankful if we're not operating in this faith. If we don't see a bigger picture when trials come our way, if we don't understand that God is faithful, that God can't lie, that God is going to come through for us, we will get knocked out of thanksgiving and Satan's going to undercut our feet. Someone say amen. amen. So I want to teach you, even in the midst of your greatest trial, I don't just mean on Thanksgiving weekend, which is great to be thankful on Thanksgiving, right? But we need to practice thanksgiving all year long. One of the things that God is working in my life, and I'm not perfect at this thing by far, but one of the things that he's working in my life, he's teaching me this, that no matter what happens in my life, learn to be thankful, and also to learn, I've been talking about this, learn to cast off worry. Me and Charlie talking about a little bit this morning. Said, I'm not worried about this, I'm not worried. What good would worry do me anyway? Who said that? Get a gold star. It wouldn't, it wouldn't help you one bit. To, you can wring your hands. You can worry. And you can fret. But it is not going to change one thing about your life. But I tell you what. In the midst of worry. And in the midst of trial. You can raise a hand up. And you say thank you Jesus. I know that you're faithful. I know that you're my Lord. And I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know that you're Lord. And my faith tells me everything is going to be all right. I am going to overcome this world. That is a great weapon in your arsenal. You actually can't de defeat a person that's grateful and thankful. Paul said in Philippians, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Guys, that's just not a suggestion. And if we can't do that, then you've been knocked off the course. And some great saints in the Lord... Uh, even in this room, some great saints in the Lord sometimes, we allow the trials and the things because it seems like there's a constant onslaught coming out as one thing after another and after another. And I'm telling you what the enemy wants to do is he wants to knock you off your foundation. What we say and what we do matters. In, in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, and there's many Proverbs like this. It says you're snared by the words of your mouth. You're snared by what you say. We're snared in life when we agree with the devil. And I'm telling you, that's his plan. That is his plan. He wants us to agree with him. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says he gives, he gives the Corinthians a warning. 
And he tells them, hey, don't be grumblers like the children of Israel were because when they grumbled, snakes came and bit them. You remember that? When they grumbled against God, had the snakes come out. He said, those things were written to give us a warning. We're not going to have snakes come out in the congregation and bite us, but Satan would love to get our minds on ourselves, off of the word, off of God, so he can come in and just say metaphorically, snake bite us and pull us off the path. He says, don't be like that. These things happened as a warning to us. He said, don't, he said, don't commit fornication or sexual immorality like they did. But he, we always, as Christians, sometimes we major on people's sexual conduct, but he equated grumbling on the same level as sexual immorality, people that grumble. That's not any of you, right? We got, got any grumblers out there, amen? We are in a spiritual war. And I'll tell you something else we do and something that the enemy tries to get us to do. The word says we don't wrestle flesh and blood and we, we're always thinking that we're wrestling against flesh and blood. We think our problem is that person that's persecuting us or that situation that's come. Maybe someone says something about us and we think, oh, there's my problem right there. My problem is my husband. My problem is my wife. My problem is this person. Now, you're not wrestling against that person. My problem is that this happened in my business or that happened. We're not wrestling against those things. We have an enemy of our soul that wants to pull us down into an earth level to walk in the natural, to not be supernatural, not to rise above our... So his whole arsenal is meant to snare you and trip you up. And pretty soon, you're saying exactly what the enemy wants you to say and not what God... Now, I know not you guys. You're, you're doing good at this. We start saying exactly what the enemy wants us to say. Jesus said over and over again, he said, be it to you according to your faith. Or he says, what do you want me to do? And he was listening to what people were saying. Many times in the word, Jesus would say, because of your words or because of what you said, boom, I'm going to do this thing. He says, because of, your, because of what you said, I'm going to do this. Or woman, great is your faith. As you said it, that's how it's going to be. He was always looking for faith. In the story of the um, centurion, he came to Jesus and told Jesus, hey, you don't even have to visit my sick a servant. You just say the word. Speak the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus commended him for having great faith because he knew the power of the spoken words. Word. I was reading in the... This morning in 1 John, and John says that the message that God sent, he said that the word became life. God's word was manifested and became alive. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So what we see when we see Jesus is God's logos, his expression, his thought becoming words. And Jesus gave what? He gave the word of what? The word of life. The Bible calls him the prince of life. Everything he said was in response to God. It was positive and it was life-filled. You never heard Jesus say anything that wasn't in line with faith, that wasn't in line with God's word. It was always uh, spoken uh, to what the Father wanted them to say. He said that my words, they are spirit and they are life. And that's the battle, the spiritual battle that we're in. I really believe that Satan doesn't have any power. Oh, Satan doesn't over a believer. Not one bit of power. Think about it. Think about it. Bible says in Colossians 2.15. That Jesus disarmed the rulers and the authorities of this world. And he made a open show. He triumphed over them. And they say that that language is like uh, the Roman, the Caesars, when they were coming in and they would have their, uh, they had victory and they'd come into town in a parade and they would triumph and they'd drag their enemies, the slaves, the elephants, whatever they had, they would drag them into a victory procession, an absolute victory. And people would sell, say, uh, hail Caesar. And they called him Lord. Caesar is what? Curios, Greek word, Caesar is Lord. They would shout it out. He's Lord. And he would, 
he would have his uh, enemies in a train. That's what Jesus did to Satan. Bible, the Word of God says we've been translated out of his dominion. I, I preach this about every third week. I'll use this scripture. We've been translated out of his authority. Now, are we out of Satan's authority? Or are we not? Are we or aren't we? The Bible says we are. Jesus says that all authority has been given to me. Now you go. We have been translated out of his authority, and we have victory. He conquered it. So, because of that, his strategy, as it has always been, is deception, lying, deceit, slander, malice, anything he can do to throw on you, the victorious one, the one that has victory in Christ, anything he can throw on you, so you line up with him, Instead of God. It's so easy to prove. What happened to Adam and Eve in the garden? Who had authority in the garden? Adam had authority. Did Satan have authority? How did he get it? How did he get the authority back? He deceived him. He tricked him. He deceived him into giving it back. That's what he wants to do in your life. He wants to trick you and deceive you. And pretty soon you're just handing over the keys. You're handing over the authority. You're handing over the dominion in your life. And he does it through trials. He does it through temptation, through sin. Anything he can do to trick you to line up with him instead of God the Father. Someone say amen. amen. I want to teach you this. And, and I think honestly it's more important for me... People, uh, I've been taught a lot about what you say. To me, it's more important about your heart condition. Like if your heart's not right, you're not going to say anything right anyway. If you don't have revelation and understanding of the spiritual battle, I could teach all day on this. You go right home and yell at your wife. Just boom. You just go right home because your heart's not right. You just go home, boom. Yell at you. The Word of God says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that your prayers are hindered if you don't love your wife. See Satan's strategy? trying to get you to come out against your wife, trying to get you to be fighting and warring with your wife. As soon as you do, it says your prayers are hindered. Did I make that up? No, your prayers get hindered. You know, when you walk in unforgiveness, you walk in bitterness, these things will hinder your walk with God. So, so the, the, the adversary's strategy is always to trick you and to deceive you and for you to use your authority against yourself. The grumbling, the fault-finding... And I've talked about this before, when you start saying, nothing ever works out for me, you're in a dangerous place. Because you are no longer walking in thanksgiving, are you? You are no longer walking by faith. Doesn't the word say, the just shall live by nothing ever works for me? I would hate to think that the Lord would say, be it to you according to your faith. Right? You actually, and this, this is spiritual, but it's also just even in a certain sense, uh, uh, neuropsychology, you actually program yourself with what you say. You actually do that. That's, that when you say something, it registers on yourself, and you're going to behave according to what you say anyway. We're guided by our hearts. We follow our heart. If our heart believes something, we're going to, how could a whole nation of people uh, believe in and follow Adolf Hitler? How could they do that? There was so much deception there. There was so much hatred there. There was so much wickedness there. And yet a whole nation just followed him, programming their, their hearts. After what he's saying, they're believing it and they're following. The Bible says in the last days that people will hear a lie and they'll, and they'll believe those lies and they'll be destroyed because they did not love truth. They did not love righteousness. That's none of you. Amen? Amen? So if Satan is going to derail you, and I did not say that you will not have troubles, struggles, trials, need patience, and all these things that come. I did not say that. But if he is going to overcome you, he's going to use you against yourself. Honestly, he cannot defeat a man or woman that stands in faith against God. Now, I don't know. Maybe the Lord, you know, I know people have died for their faith. They weren't defeated, were they? There's a special reward in heaven for people that die for their faith. They get a martyr's crown. You're not defeated just because you get wiped out in life. You get defeated when you turn your faith and your focus and your thanksgiving off of God. 
the story of Job, and I, I don't like to weigh in a lot of times on the theology behind Job. Seems like everybody has different sermons on that. But one thing we know from the lesson of Job, that in the end, God was good, wasn't he? The whole story of Job, it only lasted either six months to two years, they say. It only lasted a short period of time. And then at the end of that time, everything flipped. And what we found out was God was paying attention. God was listening to Job during his trials. And God came at the end and he blessed and he rewarded Job. And some of you I know need to hear, like James chapter 5 says, you know the patience of Job, right? Abraham, the word says that he obtained the promises through faith and through patience. It wasn't just faith. So here is the enemy of your soul's strategy. He wants to get you to walk in ingratitude, ungratefulness. He wants to get you to walk where you're not thankful for what you have, that you're a complainer. Get your eyes off the Lord so he can just wipe you out. And if you feel like your life is already under attack and negative things are already going on, what Jesus wants to do is get you to line back up with him and start thanking him. If you're going through an incredible time in your life of great distress, I would encourage you. I would daily get up in the morning before you go to bed at night, just start thanking God for every good thing in your life. Amen? Just start thanking God. Start glorifying God when, when, uh, when, when things come at you. You know, it's been a great liberty to me and a great freedom to me just to see this when you can really understand that the stuff that's going on in your world and in your life, you're actually in a battle where you can put up your dukes. You don't have to operate in the flesh when you realize you want to be a strong man and you want to be an over. When you really realize you're in a, it's like running a race. I ran a 10K, turkey trot 10K on Thursday. And in that race, I was in a battle. I had some, some old guy, I think he was like 48 years old, some old guy <laughs> trying to beat me. And him and I, we were in a battle. And I knew I was in a battle. And something about that, Jeff, just appealed to me. I just liked it. I'm, he got ahead of me a little bit. And then I know the heat was, I beat him last year. And then this year he's coming back and he's beating me. But something about being a man, something inside me, I knew I was in a battle and it made it exciting. So I started chasing him down. We got to mile three and I, I was coming down the hill and I got closer and closer and I got even. We pulled together at mile four and I could feel the heat of the battle and I just took off. Now I was dead tired. I could barely breathe at the time, but I really wanted to beat him. It was exciting because there's something about being in a battle. It should encourage us when you know you're in a fight and you want to win. Do you want to lay over like a dead dog? You're going to fight. We can understand this. I was a football team that played a game yesterday. And it looked like in the fourth quarter, they just laid down like a bunch of, which I love that team. I'm not uh, complaining about them, nor am I against them. I love them. They have the best receivers in football, and they proved it yesterday. But man, they just, it just seemed like the other team, that other team wanted that game more than they did. That other team came to play. They came to win. They were knocking them over, beating them up, running up and down the field like they were a peewee football team. Amen? They came to win. That's the stuff that Christians need to have in us in this spiritual battle that we're in. And we're not just in it for ourselves. Every victory, every victory that you win, you don't just win it for yourself. You win it for your wife. Shane, you win it for your family. You're in a battle. You win it for your family. You're in a spiritual battle, you win it for your grandkids. You're in a spiritual battle, you win it for your church. You're in a spiritual battle, you win that for your community. This thing is bigger than we are. If I get wiped out, I don't know how many, you know, it's going to affect somebody, amen? If I get wiped out, it's going to affect that person. I went into Walmart and I just prayed, I was praying to God this week. I said, Lord, use me today. I want to be useful. I walked into Walmart, I had a whole, there were six different 
people that, that the Lord impacted in Walmart just because he gave me victory. If I get wiped out and I'm ungrateful and I'm unthankful, I'm not going to stop and ask somebody if I can pray for him. If I get my focus on this world, I'm not going to see this. I'm gonna, when I see someone I know, and I know you've done it before, I'm going to go the other way. Anybody ever done that? Don't you lie. You've never done that? Don't feel like talking to anybody. Life isn't good. You see someone you know and you shoot down the other aisle. I'm a really bad person, ain't I? <laughs> I'm human, thank you. Now, I'd rather go in there looking for somebody to bless. Pray a prayer. Jeff, just pray to prayer. Lord, I want to be useful. And go in and just run into one person after another person after another person that needs courage and needs prayer. If you get wiped out, the people that... You're going to bless. I get emails and text messages from this guy from Haiti probably two or three times a week thanking our church for supporting those kids in Haiti. Mark and Lee. He constantly sends me messages. And if there wasn't a grace point, there'd be 150 kids three times a week that would not be getting a meal. It is important that you overcome. And if you can't do it for yourself, do it for your family. It's important that you overcome. If you can't do it for yourself, do it for the Lord. Don't let the devil snare you with the words of your mouth. You want to beat the devil when he thinks he has you down at your lowest point? Praise God. Start thanking God. God hears that stuff. Go into your prayer closet and go worship God. You'll hear God will start talking to you in the middle of your battle. I, I, Jeff, I've been reading the book of Kings. It's so exciting. We have a mutual friend that he said, I wish I was back in the Old Testament. Because when God sent them out, someone would give them a hard time. They'd just take a sword and they'd whack them. They'd just go chop their head. I said, wait a minute now. We're in a little different warfare now. <laughs> he wanted to grab a sword. But you see these battles. These people had faith in the Lord. And they would go out and they'd praise God and they'd go to war. These were men. Men had an instinct for war. And they would go out and fight God's battles. As long as they did what the Lord said, as long as they obeyed the Lord, they had great victory. The minute they turned away from God, followed their own ways, they got wiped out. We're not in a physical battle like that. But we are in a battle don't let the enemy steal your victory. And victory is an attitude of your heart. That's the battle. Take your faith. That's the battle to rob you. When the word says the thief comes not, but for to steal, kill, and destroy, he's trying to steal the word of God in your heart. He's trying to steal, steal and rob you of your future. Everything he's doing is meant for destruction. Meanwhile, everything the Lord's doing, he's doing to try to bless you. Try to put you over into victory. I'm going to say this. It's about time to close. I want you to start warring with your thanksgiving in the midst of your trial. If you can't do it, well, then you've got to repent because your heart's hard. You've got to change your way of thinking. When Jesus said repent, he meant change your thinking. Change your way of seeing. I've been teaching on what you're seeing. Change the way you're seeing. Change the way you see. Repent. Get your heart soft again. Understand that Jesus is Lord and he, he is real. And start thinking right about the Lord. In the Old Testament, how many times they said over and over and over that God is good. It says there is no lack. The young lions lack and they suffer hunger. But those that seek the Lord, those that wait on the Lord, says they'll not lack for any good thing. That's God's intention towards you. He wants to do you good. When Jesus did miracles, I'm going to end here, I'm landing. When Jesus did miracles, how, how did he work them? Then by faith? Did he, did he do dances? What, what was the number one way? I mean, I know he laid hands on people. What was his number one way? He touched people. His number one way was through words. He spoke. Just go through. Most of them, he touched people. He did a lot of things. Uh, most of the miracles that you read about, he just spoke something. He said something. got to change the way we think, to change the way we see Jesus and God, change the way we believe so we can change the way we speak. You're either going to say, you're either going to say during the midst of a trial, Lord, you're going to get me through this, 
or you're going to say, why does this always happen to me? It was the greatest revelation of my life when I quit saying, God, why does this always happen to me? And I started thanking him and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's when victory started coming into my life. Lord, what do you want me to do? And start listening to God and doing what he told me to do. Lining my tongue up. I'm glad I, me and Pam, we hold each other accountable in this way. You can hold each other accountable. Got to get our words over with God. Bible says, and the book of Proverbs is full of it, and I'll end here. It says, life and death are in the power of your tongue. Life and death are in the power of your tongue. I'm not talking about some new age concept. I'm talking about the word of God. Jesus was the word of life. God, that's what God wants to come out of your mouth. Words of life, words of thanksgiving, words of affirmation. There is no way that a person can constantly be thanking and praising God, standing in faith and get defeated. There's no way. It's impossible. God would not let that happen. You see the battle you're in? It's the battle for your heart. It's pretty powerful. I encourage you this week, Go in the Word and just look up in the Bible about, just even in the book of Proverbs or the book of James, he talks about it. Just go in there and look about what it says about your speech. I've been asking the Lord, Lord, purify my heart, purify my soul. So I know my spirit's born again, it's pure, but purify my soul, Lord, so much. Don't allow any corruption in my soul. Just let it be pure so it's a pure flow of God that comes out of my mouth and out of my heart. Don't let anything impure get up in my head or help me to dispose of it, Lord, by faith. So what I say is pure. How about you? Amen? Well, we've all failed there a time or two, haven't we? Let's be honest. I'm, I'm not coming to you as an expert because we're all in the same battle. That's where we need to pray for one another because your brother and sister are in battles. I pray for you guys all the time. I pray for you guys all the time because I know you're in a battle. You're in a war. That's why we need to pray for one another. And it's a choice we have to make. How you doing out there? Every head bowed, every eye closed, just... I don't have the sense that anybody here needs to give their life to the Lord. I believe we're all saints here. I'll ask, if you don't know the Lord and you want to give your life to the Lord, can I see your hand? It's just going to give you an opportunity. I have something else I want to do. But you don't know the Lord. You've never been saved. Jesus died for you on a cross. He took your sins away from you. He washed you white as clean. All you have to do, the Bible says when you confess his name as Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. You get translated out of this wicked, devilish world and into God's kingdom. If you've never done that, I'd like to pray for you today. Is there anybody here like that you want to pray today and invite Christ in your life? I don't see anybody, but if you're there and you want to talk to me about it, I'm always available to talk about. Here's another thing, and this is just, I want to pray for you. Say, Brother Brad, I've been struggling. I've been getting whipped in my life. My words have been stout against God. I've been, I'm that person that's been saying nothing ever works out for me. I'm that person that's constantly speaking things I shouldn't, and I want to leave here today knowing my slate's clean. I just want to pray with you. Who is that? I want to start again. Lord, forgive my, let's take my words, throw them in the garbage dump. Let's do a rewind, get all that under the blood. And I want to start again. Is that you today? I want to pray for you. Let me see your hand. Okay, I see, I see a hand there, two hands. Three. Anybody else? Here, here's what I'm asking. Four, I'm not, I'm not going to call you up. I am going to pray for you. Get, you're going to know when you leave here, you're forgiven. You're going to get a fresh start. You're going to start at this again. Anybody else want a fresh start today? Okay, I see that hand. I want a fresh start, Lord. I'm raising my hand. Jesus, I, want, I, see, I see that hand. I see that hand. I want a fresh start too, Lord. I see that hand. About eight of us. Father God, I am praying for us 
We're, we're being judgment day honest before you, Lord. There's some stuff that we want to throw in the garbage dump, Lord. Some of our attitudes, our way of seeing the world, people, that when people attack us or things don't go our way or when trials come at us, God, sometimes we're just in over our heads and we don't know what to do. But in the midst of our trial, Lord, in the midst of the battle, I am asking you, Lord, to remind us to be thankful. We can do that. We can express gratitude. We can express thankfulness for what we do have. God, take, our, take those words, Lord. We just throw them away, Lord. We're asking for a reboot today, a fresh start. Lord, we know you're merciful and gracious. Jesus, you're our Lord. We're asking you to bring your kingdom and your understanding and your revelation fresh to us, the weapons and the tools and the warfare that we're in. We're praying for that. Lord, I pray for these today, that they'll leave here knowing all that stuff is gone. It's under the blood of Jesus Christ. We have a fresh start. We're going to claim a crop failure on the things we've been saying, and we're looking to begin again, Lord. Brand new today. I thank you for your forgiveness. It's real, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right.